Would you pray with me? Father, we come into your presence this day. Father, we hear those words that call to surrender. And Father, we would ask that in these moments, you would do that. Uh, Work within us, Father, draw us to that place in our lives. Father, in our walk with you and our walk with Christ. Father, we do ask that as we come to your word that you would, as the psalmist says, open our eyes that we would see wonderful things. Father, not just that we'd be drawn in wonder to that which you have said, but Father, that we would be drawn to respond to you in ways that are appropriate for a child of God and the follower of Christ. Father, to that end, lead us by your spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, There was a gentleman named Douglas Hyde. He was a one-time Communist Party leader in England. In 1947, he defected from the party, and he spent the rest of his life working to expose the movement. He wrote a book titled Dedication and Leadership, and in the book he highlighted some of the principles practiced by the Communist Party that he felt Christians would do well to embrace in their own lives. In his book, he noted that practically every party member is a dedicated man in whose life, from the time he rises in the morning until the time he goes to bed at night, for 365 days a year, communism is the dominant force. And he, again, he was writing this book to say, you know what, there are some things he had seen in communism that you might want to apply to your walk with Christ. Now, listen to that statement again and make some insertions there. Practically every follower of Christ is a dedicated man or woman in whose life, from the time they rise in the morning until the time they go to bed at night, for 365 years, the follower of Christ or following Christ, is the dominant force. What would happen if that were true? Is it true? In his book also, Hyde described communists as 100 percenters in a world of 50 percenters. Giving 100% to the party, to the vision, while others in the world are giving perhaps 50% to what they hold dear. It was Vladimir Lenin, leader of the Communist Party at one time, who said, we must train men and women who will devote to the revolution, not merely their spare evenings, but the whole of their lives. The whole of their lives. Well, here in the land of the free and the home of the brave, where rights gain far more headlines than responsibilities and duties. In a land which was born in a declaration of independence, surrender talk has fallen on hard times. And that's even true in the church of Jesus Christ. We we hear far too little of surrender. Many as followers of Christ, we're, we're willing to do A, B, and C. But X, Y, and Z, you know, I'm, I'm going to hold that in reserve. I'm not willing to go that far in my relationship with Christ. So I, I'll do, I'll agree to this, but I won't agree to that. So full surrender of our rights to another, even to our Savior Jesus Christ. At times, that can be a hard pill to swallow. Even if the one who invites us to surrender to him, to his word, to his will, to his ways, is the one who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us. Our creator God, his son, our Savior Jesus Christ, held nothing in reserve but made full surrender for our good, for our salvation. Even to him, we'll commit maybe an evening, 
but full devotion, complete surrender. Well, let me think about that for a moment and what that might have to look like and what changes I might need to make if that were to be the reality of my walk with Jesus. So here's the thing. For Christians, surrender is not simply giving God what we feel we can spare, but giving our all to him. The principle of surrendering to God is depicted for us in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And we want to take a look at that this morning. And as we look at these passages of Scripture, be asking ourselves, am I a hundred percenter in my walk with Jesus Christ? Or has my percent that I'm willing to give and to spare larger than it should be? So let's take a look. The first thing we want to notice this morning is a depiction of giving all and surrender to God. We want to focus and contemplate on that just for a few moments. And that picture in the Old Testament is the picture of the burnt offering. The scriptures do provide a number of pictures that that help us understand what it means to be a true, fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And one of the most compelling pictures in all of scripture is that of the burnt offering. The burnt offering was most freak, was the most frequent form of sacrifice offered during the Old Testament times when the, when the temple was available to bring sacrifices to. It was the most comprehensive of all the offerings in meaning. A burnt offering could be given at the temple as simply a, a voluntary act of worship. You experience some blessing from the Lord and you want to respond, you would do so with a burnt offering. Or you recognize that there was some sin that you had committed, be it intentional or unintentional. And so when you recognize that, when God brought that to your mind, when you discovered some offensive way in in you as David did, you would take a burnt offering as a understanding and recognition of your sin. The burnt offering was also simply an expression of devotion. God, I'm giving you this offering. I'm making this offering to you because I want you to know that I'm a 100 percenter. And sometimes this offering was made to just as a simple expression of complete commitment and surrender and love for God. Well, as Dennis read for us earlier, Leviticus 1 spells out the details of a burnt offering. Among other things, we learned that that prime breeding stock was to be used in the burnt offering. A male without defect. Now, you want to build your herds. You want to build your portfolio. It makes no sense to give a male without defect. That's where the herd was built. The demonstration of devotion, surrender, and the burnt offering was meant to cost, was meant to cost the giver something of prime value. You didn't demonstrate your love and devotion to God by offering your seconds or that which could be spared from the herd or that which wouldn't cost you too much in the long run. And you think, well, who would ever do that? Well, you know what? People did that. The people of God tried to get away with that. We go to the book of Malachi. And Malachi sees what's happening as he sees the people of God being far from a hundred percenters. And the Lord speaking through the prophet said, when you bring blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? Of course you know it's wrong. You've been to Sunday school. You know what Leviticus chapter 1 says. When you bring an offering for sacrifice, a burnt offering for sacrifice, and you bring a blind animal, is that not wrong? Yes, of course it is. You know it is. When you bring crippled or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Yes, of course they knew it was. Try offering them to your governor. See if he's willing to accept as payment for taxes a blind animal or a crippled animal or a diseased animal. You would never do that. You'd never get away with that. 
But you profane my name by saying of the Lord's table, by saying of the altar, it's contemptible. And you say, what a burden God has placed upon me to expect such payment, such sacrifice. So, a burnt offering, an expression of love, payment for sin, an expression of gratitude, was to be a male without defect. But likewise, Leviticus 1 tells us that the priest was to burn all of it. Burn all of it. Some offerings, you were able to withhold some of the offering for yourself. And for some offerings, the priests were able to keep reserve some for themselves as part of their payment or honorarium for being a priest and going about the business and doing that which God has called them to do. So some offerings you were able to, to, to make it and then withhold some of it either for yourself or for others. But this was the priests were to burn all of it. Sometimes this offering was called a holocaust offering a thorough destruction a complete destruction the whole of it was burnt nothing was saved or held back the giver of the burnt offering was left with nothing for themselves the entire animal was given to God with nothing left and reserved. Burn all of it. And finally, we know this about the burnt offering. That is a burnt offering, an offering made by fire, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. When one of God's people voluntarily, of their own accord, surrendered something of such great value to him and expecting nothing in return except the privilege of expressing their love and devotion to God, such an expression never failed to put a smile on God's face. With such sacrifice, God was always pleased. It was a fragrant aroma pleasing to the Lord. Oh, God says when he smells that burnt offering... That smells good, because I know it comes from a heart fully devoted to me. Now, it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, that in Jesus we find the fulfillment of that which was depicted in the burnt offering. Jesus, the Lamb of God, offered his body as a burnt offering. He offered it in complete consecration and surrender to the will of his Father. He held nothing in reserve for himself. He who did not spare his own son, who gave that which was most important to him. Jesus, the Lamb of God. The Apostle Peter connects the dots for us when he writes, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as gold or silver, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. He said, No, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ a lamb without defect or blemish, a perfect sacrifice. A sacrifice from which nothing was withheld, which was necessary for our salvation. For our salvation, neither God the Father nor God the Son held anything back. They kept nothing of value in reserve, nothing necessary for our salvation for themselves, but gave the ultimate sacrifice for us, surrendering all for us. Oh, may we, along with the apostles, join in worship, proclaiming the, the one voice, the voice that says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Oh, you want to get a picture in your mind of what giving all looks like for the follower of Jesus Christ. We look to the burnt offering and we look to the sacrifice of the perfect Lamb of God. So we see the depiction in the Old Testament. But likewise, 
And as we turn to the New Testament, we see the expectation of giving all and surrender to God. And this is a surrender that the follower of Christ is called to embrace. And that expectation of giving all, what that is, as Paul says, it is the offering of our bodies. In light of Christ's surrender of his will to his fathers and the sacrifice of his life for our own, it seems like a response is in order. In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul spells out in great detail the work of God in Christ on our behalf as he takes us from Romans 1 through Romans 11, just talking about all that God has done to accomplish our salvation. And as Paul has spent 11 chapters just reflecting upon that and writing about that and prayed over that and being led by the Holy Spirit to consider that, as he comes to the end of chapter 11, he is so overwhelmed by wonder and awe and praise that he just cannot help himself but overflow with praise to God for that which he has done on behalf of Paul and of all of mankind, and especially of those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul raises up in worship, oh, what a wonderful God we have. How great are his worships or his riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and methods. For who can know the thing, Lord, what the Lord is thinking? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to repay it back? For everything comes from him, everything exists by his power, and it is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. Oh, what a wonderful God we have. He did not spare anything in bringing us in Christ to salvation. Paul was simply overwhelmed by that which God had done in Christ for him. When was the last time that you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, were overwhelmed by the reality of that which God in Christ has done for you? When was the last time that your heart just welled up in praise and worship. When was the last time that you said, Jesus paid it all? All to him I owe. When was the last time, as another songwriter says, alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? Yes, he would devote that sacred head for sinners such as I. Paul understood that, and he was overwhelmed by the glory of God. When was the last time we were overwhelmed? Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amazing love. When was the last time you were overwhelmed by the love of God in Christ? Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, a grace that exceeds, a grace that surpasses, a grace that is sufficient to deal with our sin and our guilt. When was the last time you were overwhelmed by the grace of God for the work that God has done in Christ for our salvation? Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all our sin. When was the last time you were overwhelmed? Love so amazing, so divine. Demands of this response. Demands my life, my soul, my all. No, it's appropriate that we with the Apostle Paul should be overwhelmed by that which God in Christ has done on the cross for us. The sacrifice that was made for us, the burnt offering in which nothing was held in reserve for our salvation. Paul is overwhelmed. Oh, I mean, we too likewise be overwhelmed. Paul then, in the book of Romans, he, he, he goes from the, talking about the workings of salvation to expressing his wonder at God's salvation. And then, as we come to chapter 12, Paul shifts his focus to the appropriate response to this great salvation. How do we respond as those who 
are children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul's focus shifts from theological explanation to personal application. He writes, therefore, I urge, that that word urge, I, I beg, I plead with you. If you understand the grace of God, the salvation that you have in Christ, if what you, if what I've written in these first 11 chapters, Paul is saying, if it means anything to you, if you comprehend at all what God has done for you, therefore, he said, I beg you, I plead with you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, his mercy to you, his grace to you, which is demonstrated in chapters 1 through 11 of the book of Romans. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And then Paul says, this is your spiritual act of worship. Now, if you have the New International Version of the New Testament or the Bible, or if you have a King James Version on your lap this morning, you'll notice that the word spiritual can be, and in some translation, has been translated as reasonable. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your reasonable. This makes sense. This is your reasonable act of mercy, or of worship. The, the, the word there that's translated as spiritual or reasonable is the word logikos in the Greek. This is logical. If you understand the grace and the power of God in your salvation, there's only one logical conclusion that you can come to. There's only one logical response that you can make. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Nancy Lee DeMoss, her married name is Wolgamuth, Nancy Wolgamuth DeMoss, gave this definition of what it means to offer our bodies. She writes, this is the manifesto for Christians' surrender to God. Our bodies represent the sum total of all that we are, all that we have, and all that we do. As those Old Testament believers signified their consecration by offering up sacrifices to be utterly consumed on the altar, consumed, leaving nothing in reserve, nothing to spare for themselves, so we are to offer ourselves in totality to be consumed by God. Paul's language purposely draws from the Old Testament sacrifices and specifically the burnt offering. We are to offer our best, all that we are, all that we have, and all that we do. We are to offer all that we have, sparing nothing. And when we do so, we too can be assured of God's pleasure in our offering. There are many similarities between the burnt offering and the living sacrifice that Paul speaks of here. But there is one difference. A burnt offering is made once, and then it's over. Paul calls us to go far beyond a one-time consecration and devotion of all that we are. He says we offer ourselves as living sacrifices so that we can offer ourselves, we can send, surrender ourselves over and over and over again, that we can make a daily surrender to the purposes of God. That is the logical, the reasonable thing to do in light of God's grace and mercy to us. So I ask and I've wondered at times, what does offering our bodies look like? You know, those are fine words and they flow off the tongue. But what does that really look like? What does it look like to offer our bodies as living sacrifices daily to the purposes and to the pleasures of the God who has set us free from sin and saved us through his son, through the death of his son, Jesus Christ? What does that look like? Well, as I sat at my desk, my thoughts took a, a rabbit hole. They, they, they sort of veered off course a little bit. 
Maybe your thoughts do that at times. But as I was working, I, I, I began thinking to growing up in my home church. And I remember gathering together, and I think it was in the basement room in my home church. Um, and it wasn't the church that now exists up in the Greeley, Illinois area. But it was the one burnt down back in, it was April 1966 or so. Um, I, I remember going to that church. And I remember being in the basement, and I remember a bunch of us young kids there having a singing time. I don't know if it was a Sunday morning, I don't think it was Sunday school, maybe a Sunday evening, a Wednesday evening. And on the, on the bulletin board, there was a picture of a child with some of its body parts missing. (laughs) And we would begin to sing, and as we would sing, one of the children in the group was given one of the body parts to put on the cutout of the little child. And so we would sing, Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. And one of us children in the the audience would go up and we'd, we'd put the eyes up there on the little child. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. There's a father of above who's looking down in love. Oh, so be careful, little eyes, what you see. Offering our bodies, our eyes, to the purposes of God. And then we continue to sing, Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. There's a father up above who's looking down in love. So be careful, little ears, what you hear. And then the child with the hands would go and they'd place them on the cutout. And and we'd sing, oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. There's a father up above who's looking down in love. So be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. Oh, be careful, little mind, what you think. Oh, be careful, little heart what you love. As I was thinking about that children's song emblazoned on my mind when I was, before I was six years old, it dawned on me that if we surrender our eyes and if we surrender our ears and our hands and our feet and our mouths and our minds and our hearts to the purposes of God, that is offering our bodies, all that we have, all that we are, all that we do to the praise and to the glory of God. And it's only logical that we as followers of Jesus Christ would choose, would want to do so. When we do so, we will be well on our way to living out what it means to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. And we will be well on our way to living in full and daily surrender to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For Christians, surrender is not simply giving to God what we feel we can spare, but giving to him all that we are, all that we have, all that we do. Now, God doesn't desire a burnt offering from us. Instead, he longs for everyone who is his child. He longs for us to offer to him a living sacrifice. The offering of our bodies that all that we are, all that we have, all that we do, 100% will be laid before his throne for his pleasure and for his purposes. The question is, am I? And if you are a follower of Christ, if you claim a relationship with Jesus Christ this morning, are we giving him our all? Are our eyes looking only upon those things that honor him? Are our ears listening to only those things that honor him? Are our hands doing only those things that honor him? Are our feet taking us only to the places that honor him? Are the words of our mouth saying, speaking only words that honor him? Is our mind filled with only thoughts that honor him? 
Is our heart set only on those things and loving those things that bring honor to him? Oh, may we not not give the occasional use of our bodies, but may we give ourselves without reserve to him. Sparing nothing, surrendering all that we are, all that we have, all that we do to Christ. Is it all on the altar? Oh, may we hold nothing in reserve. May there be no area of our lives where we tell our Creator and our Redeemer, you have no right to this. This is mine. You keep your hands off. I'm holding this area of my life. I'm keeping this area of my life in reserve. Not for your pleasures. Not for your purposes. But for my pleasure. And for my purpose. Oh, may it never be so. And here's the thing. The fullness of joy. That which we desire for ourselves. The joy that only God himself can bestow upon us. That joy that we want so much will never be experienced if we are holding anything back. From Christ. But that joy that we long for, that joy that we want so much, is found only in surrendering our all to Him. We are reminded by the song that we sing in closing this morning, but we never can prove, we can never experience the delights of His love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. Oh, my prayer for myself is that all that I have, all that I am, all that I do will be laid daily upon the altar in in loving devotion to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May that be the heartbeat for each one of us here this morning, that daily we lay it all on the altar, offering our bodies, offering all that we have, all that we are, all that we do, to the praise of his glory, because this is the reasonable thing, the logical thing for a follower of Christ, for someone who has been saved by grace through faith. It is the only logical thing to do. Oh, may we go and do likewise. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for the picture that you've given us of the burnt offering in which nothing was sold back, nothing was kept in reserve, nothing was used for one's own pleasure, but all and only for your purpose and your pleasure. Father, as we look at our lives, Father, we pray that if there's any offensive way in us, Father, if there's any area of our life where there is less than complete surrender to the loving lordship of our Savior Jesus, Father, may you speak truth to us. Father, may you show us that we may repent of it and turn from it, that we may experience your blessing and the fullness of joy that you intend for your people. Father, we thank you for your love for us. Father, we thank you that you did not spare your own son, but gave himself up for us. Father, give us great joy as we spare nothing, as we hold nothing in reserve, holding back from you and holding in reserve for ourselves. Father, give us joy. Give us that peace. Father, help us to live logical lives in light of the glorious salvation that you have given to us through Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey and to lay it all on the altar each day. Would you stand as we sing those words together?
But to trust and